first one that we have here is for Code for Pakistan. Um, uh, Zarina, my colleague, says uh, he's interested in hearing how and why you integrated WhatsApp um, into Floodlight. We at my society have been considering it also for tools aimed at neighborhood groups. Just comments on your experience of WhatsApp. So uh, the main reason to use WhatsApp, like the why of WhatsApp is we use a lot of WhatsApp. Like we do a lot of communication using WhatsApp, our office communication even are on WhatsApp. I'm, I'm still getting messages, I'm still getting messages, sorry. I'm still getting messages on my WhatsApp in different groups. So that, that's the why of uh, we integrated WhatsApp. But how did we integrate WhatsApp? We basically used the WhatsApp API to, to uh, we dedicated a hotline. So it was basically a number, people were sending messages and initially we were doing all, the, all of this process manually. But then we were also trying to uh, build a microservice that could extract that data and uh, automate the process to plug it into uh, the, the platform. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to break the rules and actually go to this third question, which I think could maybe go to all of our panelists, for Petra and Code for Pakistan. But Christoph, um, from your team, I'd also be interested in your reflections. I think all three of the presentations involved volunteers, moderators who were engaged in crowdsourcing information. How do you train your volunteers and moderators? How do you support them? Any tips for success? I'll go first. Uh, yeah, very good question, because I think volunteers are so important. So I would say with our teams, there are two different ways. So when we talk about mapping, you first have remote mapping. So let's say we're all sitting here in London, and we're mapping an area looking at images in Pakistan, let's say. Let's use that example. So with these, it's a lot of online training. So they're training resources, but one of the things we also organize is something called mapathon. So all of us, let's say, join together online and you can ask questions and have that information. If you're doing mapping in the field, so if you're, let's say, already in a village, maybe in Pakistan, I think we also rely on a lot of our community members. So OpenStreetMap, a community there that do these training sessions. Um, but I would say, yeah, it, it is individuals, but it's also you have a bit of the train the trainer and it is the community that you really bring together that you can ask questions and support each other. So yes, um, like Mubasar mentioned during our presentation as well, uh, we had a team of moderators and we were constantly, uh, you know, uh, creating videos in local languages. Uh, so we wanted to train the on-ground volunteers to effectively use Floodlight. Uh, so there were a lot of, uh, you know, uh, video tutorials. We used YouTube uh, videos as well. And we ensured that the volunteers on the ground properly knew how to map data effectively. So this was, uh, you know, um, an intentional effort on our part, on our team's part, that we wanted to train as many volunteers as possible. And uh, we, we, we did several videos, like both on, uh, on the technical side and mo more on the similar side as well, that how you can you know, share pictures with uh, correct geo locations and all. So yeah. Uh, Christoph, if you're still there, any reflections that you learned in your um, research about uh, successful volunteer and moderator training? Not so. Not about moderator training, but volunteers. I think it, 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 that's what I try to uh, emphasize: is you know, people care about the issue that some newspaper or even some city authority wants to get data on. Now, coming from Germany, uh, I think volunteer uh, motivation will be confronted first with uh, what about privacy uh, concerns that uh, is quite uh, you know obstacle to even. Uh, trying out such uh, new methods when it comes to citizen sensing approaches, like who will have access to the data? Who, who will it be owned by? Even if people care about the issue, they will still ask questions like, why are you using this platform? Is it secure? Uh, can I be identified, et cetera? So yeah, maybe having good answers for that is also quite important when you want to even engage young people in the sustainability transitions or like mapping some part of their neighborhood or so. Uh, so I think uh, that is what I would address up front uh, to make sure that the alliance you're working with or that also commercial use of data by a media organization is, is you know, explained before so that people don't have the feeling that they are contributing for free to a commercial product uh, that someone else is making money with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really, really interesting. It's a, a good test for any project of you, you know, all the questions your volunteers ask you before you go public with it. Um, I wondered if we had any questions in the room before we go back to another Slido question. 
if not, we've got lots on Slido. Cool. Um, great. So I think the next one, um, again, Fred Pakistan. Uh, what has been the response to floodlights from local and national governments? Yeah, so what we, we did all this activity and it was completely a community driven initiative supported by the community and there was, we, we didn't see the government in what they were doing sort of their own thing. But then once they, they saw the, the effectiveness of that, pl that platform, they reached out to us and we tried to replicate sort of this whole uh, uh, activity that we did. So government is, our government specifically is sort of notorious for uh, keeping their data uh, private, right? And so th they needed this platform, but they needed their own way of doing it to, to keep that data private. They, some of the data they wanted to make public. So we deployed this whole platform. So one of the wins for us was that uh, at the end of the day, the government also was interested in having this platform deployed for them. And uh, some of our team members were actively involved in helping them develop this, this, whole, this whole thing. I think that's a familiar story for lots of people at TikTok. You build a brilliant thing and then the government says, yes, we want a version of it, but we want to make it smaller and less open. But, you know, still extremely helpful and reach lots of people. Um, cool. Uh, great. Then maybe I'll go to you, Petra, next, if that's okay. Um, is there anything you've learned from disaster situations that could help us crowdsource data, for example, on community green spaces in peacetime? So yeah. applying the learnings into peacetime into other contexts. Yeah, I know. Yeah, very good question again. I would say again, when disasters strike, like we mobilize a lot of volunteers easily because it's, it's needed very soon and people are motivated. I think maybe two things that I can pick up on. One is obviously motivations, but I would say the other thing is also the sense of community of a lot of the like volunteers. So obviously they care about this cause, they want to contribute post earthquake, but at the same time, I think it's really the motivations of having this community of others doing that and maintaining that. So I was thinking one of the learning applying this in you know, peace time is maybe also creating this community as you volunteer or as you contribute. Because I think with a lot of our volunteers, that's really been a big thing when we ask them of, you know, they continue their contributions really through this network of other people, maybe with similar mindset. Amazing, thank you. Um, and then I think our next question is, how do you address concerns from authoritarian regi regimes who consider open mapping a general security threat? I think yeah. that goes to all the panelists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I would say with us at the Humanitarian Open Street Map, we are never like, oh, we're going to map here. It's not us making that decision. So I think that's really important every time I say it's quite a lot of us as employees, but we rely on a lot of the people who are in country. So examples like this, of course, it's open data, but when there are decisions about whether there should be additional information, I think a specific case, for instance, in Ukraine, there was a specific request not to map not to add information so it's very specific to the uh, yeah to the country but in our case as an organization we always listen to the open street map communities or the people there and kind of their decision on what's needed yeah if you had any comments on um, authoritarian regimes yeah. using um, yeah uh, people who might consider open mapping a security threat so just uh, to add to her point, we, we, we had this issue. So when we were collecting this data, we, we wanted to uh, not add that data, the data that uh, could invade someone's privacy. So we tried to, you know, take out their uh, social handles. If they allowed, if they added it themselves, it, we, we gave them the power. But then we uh, tried to, you know, not include phone numbers and those kind of things in the survey forms so that people's privacy is not invaded. Thank you so much. Um, there's a question here for you, Code for Pakistan. Um, does your organization have a role in preventing floods and natural disasters? So those maybe like early warning signs or things that happen um, beforehand? So uh, not right now, but we want to uh, get into this. We want to get into predictive analysis and we want to get more data from organizations like the World Bank and other crowdsourced organizations. Um, and we also uh, actively talking to folks, uh, some volunteers who work at NASA. So we want to get their help as well in the, on the mapping front. So this is something that uh, we are actively working on and hopefully we'll have something tangible to show. Uh -huh, yeah. That's cool. Bring NASA to the next TikTok. I'll I think I'll we'd just, all enjoy that. I'll, ju I'll just add one more point to it. The whole activity of floodlight that we did. So 
usually whenever disaster would happen, we would sort of uh, organize this whole activity. We would do this relief of that disaster. And then when we come out of it, uh, everything would, have, would, would be lost. So with floodlight, that's one of our goals, that we want to use this data so that, God forbid, if another disaster comes, mm -hmm. we are better prepared for it. We have those insights so mm -hmm. that we can focus on it. And then the, the point uh, to, uh, that Ibrahim made that we are also open to partnership with other organizations. We are currently talking with uh, some folks at NASA as well so that we can use those, those, uh, those platforms to effectively mm -hmm. get, get more insight so that we can do preventive measures. Mm, brilliant. By looking backwards, we can look forwards and, you know, yeah, yeah you've got so much. Um, brilliant. Christoph, if I could bring you in, firstly, welcoming any reflections on what we've just been talking about. But you've also got a question here. Um, your project sounds really interesting. Could it be replicated in the UK? Or I'm going to ask you another one in the group, just in case you want to combine them. Um, do you find there's a tension between a data set being built over time in public and journalists wanting secret data for a big scoop? Sorry to the people in the room, we can't highlight to it once. So just the first one. Um, uh, uh, any reflections on any of those, Christoph? I'm, I'm not sure which project is, is uh, meant here. Like if it's the InfraPublics project, I think I would definitely encourage to seek bridges between these three fields, like data journalism, civic tech, and uh, small app city or other digi public digital uh, initiatives. Because w one learning from the project is, I think I would limit it to certain types of issues that people care about. Uh, in some area, it may be actually flooding or mobility or congestion. In other places, it may be green spaces and uh, safe retreat areas or whatever. But I think the, the issue is that many are working on their own end of the problem uh, and rarely collaborate. Maybe it's different in the UK, but I think the showing the overlaps between different perspectives on the same issue, including citizens, but also including policymakers, is really what will move us forward. And I hope that journalists will also adopt a less uh, you know, one-sided or two-sided view on public issues because complex sustainability issues are not solved by a either or uh, you know, intervention. So I think what I'm trying to make uh, a pos possible through this infrastructure lens or infra publics lens is all these views somehow contribute to shaping the problem. And it can be nice to support a particular perspective through an intervention or data or a platform where people actually outside of a journalistic medium would see how that pans out in their area. So I, I think uh, what's increasingly interesting for me is local focus and the initiatives that are uh, brought up there. And the second question, I think there are two different ways uh, the, the scoop data and the scoop data set uh, is of course like uh, very much an investigative, uh, like for investigative journalism, that's a key resource. But I think what some newspapers or news organizations are trying to do is brand themselves with attention to particular issues and therefore they, they know that they need to build up resources to create not just the data, but also create awareness of the issue and create uh, support from different kinds of communities. Because there's a fine line of how much a journalist would like to step up and say, well, I'm saying this is an important issue because they also have professional demands of impartiality and, and like this kind of activist journalism is not an easy uh, task to do and many actually don't want to do that. But if there are stories that engage their audiences, which in this case are of, of course citizens, there is a, also a value for them to strengthen their profile. So I think the investigative line of having a secret data set that you can mine for some insight and the public engagement type of journalism that I've been arguing for are two different types of professional practice. That was really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, one last chance for anyone in the room to ask a question or we will do a final question on Slido. Great. Um, uh, the next one is, could Pakistan, how did you verify the reliability of the data? I think, I think this person is agreeing with you that we need more accurate information in disaster situations. You've obviously told us a bit about moderation already, but anything you wanted to expand upon there? Um, again, sorry to Helen who's doing the highlighting. I'm gonna slightly combine it for the whole panel just to close. Um, what is the future of Floodlight and can um, your team also work uh, together? Yeah, so to answer the first question, uh, we, we had different surveys. 
and they had different data. And all of that data had different methods of verification. So for example, so all the charities that we had, uh, we had a partner, uh, flood.pk, and uh, they helped us verify all that data. We collected it from different channels. So usually in disasters, what, what happens is uh, all of these news channels and all of these social media platforms, they started advertising uh, that data. So we uh, collaborate, uh, well, we, we looked at that data, we coordinated and looked uh, in different places and verified it through that, that okay, th these are the data that is accurate. And then we also asked the people, whoever uh, is going to ask them uh, for donations or uh, charity uh, to those organizations, to first, uh, to, to donate to those organizations, first reach out to them and uh, verify themselves as well. Because that, 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 that's important. Um, uh, the, the other s uh, form of data, the, the data that we were getting about where relief was needed, uh, we verified that uh, based on, so uh, we, we didn't have that too much to go on, but what we relied on was that uh, there were clusters of data. So from the same region, a lot of the people were reporting the same things. And that's sort of one of the indicators that we had that, okay, uh, this area needs this kind of uh, relief. That was one indicator for us. Uh, f uh, the other form of data, uh, since we had these partners who were implementing uh, relief uh, activities on the ground, so all of the data came from them, and so we didn't have to verify them because they were doing the activity and they were mapping it. So that, that's, that's what uh, the first question is. And then the second question, we are open to any kind of uh, collaboration. We actually believe that this is the kind of tool that's needed not just in Pakistan, it's needed worldwide. And so uh, if, if we can expand our uh, uh, cl uh, community network or collaboration network to as many people as possible, not just thought, but whomever is interested, it's, it's an open call. We want to build a consortium, we want to build an open source tool that we can use throughout the world to combat disasters in, in making sure that we are ready uh, whenever disasters hit. I'll just add to that that I think we already even have colleagues in contact and you know and we're doing work in Pakistan but I would just say I was excited to hear about floodlight and to me in open source it's exactly that it's like us sharing about these tools so others can use and I think that's the whole point of all of us collaborating mm -hmm. and sharing that because I often find with open source you're like oh I wasn't aware so like that would be my call to like everyone so I you know sharing and you know something that can be reused and useful for other contexts mm -hmm. for sure. Absolutely. And to hear about how um, Floodlight builds upon Ushahidi, and we obviously had Rhoda on the stage yesterday talking about that. We and so, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, but, you know, a plug for Tic Tech for joining everybody together, if I'm allowed to do that. Um, brilliant. Please, we have one final round of applause for our brilliant panel.